Good evening, everyone, and welcome to The Real Science Exchange, the podcast where leading scientists and industry professionals meet over a few drinks to discuss the latest ideas and trends in animal nutrition. Hi, I'm Scott Sorrell. I'm going to be your moderator tonight, and I've got my co-host tonight is Dr. Pete Morrow with Balchem. Pete, how's it going? Good to see you again. You know, we're having a great day here in wintry Wisconsin. Yeah, good stuff. Well, I was on vacation last week. It's wintry here as well, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, dreading the fact that I had to come back. Um, we're also here with my favorite retired professor, uh, Dr. Bill Weiss from Ohio State University. Bill, it's, it's been a minute, but it's good to see you again. So how you been? Same here, Scott. Real good, Scott. Same here. Yeah. Anything it's interesting? So, it's not Go ahead. so wintry in Ohio today. Not, no? It's, we, is it we warm enough? We are having winter. Oh, okay. <laughs> Bill, anything interesting in your glass tonight? I have a Smittix Red Ale. So, cheers. Right. Sounds good. Cheers. Um, I myself have uh, a Basil Hayden. My son gave this to me for Christmas. I'm surprised it's lasted this long. Uh, but uh, it's Basil Hayden, and he gave me this glass. It's a, a whiskey glass. You can't see it very well, but it's got the crest of my fraternity on it, which was Alpha Gamma Sigma uh, there at Ohio State University. So, small ag frat there in Ohio. Anyway, so Bill... Um, that's my story tonight. I see you brought a guest with you. Would you mind introducing your guest for us? It's uh, Dr. Marcia Andres, uh, Extension Specialist at University of Minnesota. I think we've known each other for 20 plus years, so been on many programs together. Yes. Excellent. Well, Marcia, thank you and, and welcome. Um, anything in your class tonight that's interesting? Yeah, I have something probably unique. So this is called Fernet, Fernet Branca. Is from Italy and is um, created back in 1845 in Milan by a person called Bernardino Branca. That's why it's called Branca. And it's composed of about 27 different herbs. And it was created as a basically a cure for worms, for fever, for cholera. So it's supposed to be a tonic <laughs> that makes you healthier. But it does have alcohol in it. Yeah, um, okay. Usually, uh, I don't drink it by itself. I have a half a pour here. And I learned when I was in Budapest back uh, about a month and a half ago that I can have Jagermeister with ice. So I'm doing Fernet with ice. And so oh, that nice. Goes. Excellent. So, uh, Marcia, are you Italian? No, I'm not. But I'm oh. this, my, this, uh, my parent, my, I guess I said my ancestry, half Italian, half German. So okay. I do have a little bit of Italian on me. So All I right. guess that brings that Fernet. Uh, very well. Well, cheers. <laughs> Here's to a, a, a great podcast this evening. Cheers, everyone. Yes. Cheers. New research is changing everything we thought we knew about choline's impact on the cow and her calf. And top scientists have a lot to say about it. They are presenting new research that supports choline as a required nutrient to optimize milk production, choline as a required nutrient to support a healthy transition, choline as a required nutrient to improve calf health and growth, and choline as a required nutrient to increase colostrum quantity. This new research is solidifying choline's role as a required nutrient for essentially every cow, regardless of health status, milk production level, or body condition score. Learn more about the science that is changing the game and the choline source that is making it happen. Reassure Precision Release Choline from Balchem. Visit balchem.com slash scientists say to learn more. So, Bill, this is a little bit uh, off the beaten path for you, the uh, topic that you selected. So kind of give us kind of a real quick overview of, of the paper that we're going to be reviewing and how'd you come uh, to pick it? Well, this, un unlike other podcasts, this is out of J a journal called JDS Communications, which is published every other month by ADSA. And it's composed of what I call very concise, very focused papers. And I actually like this journal better because the papers are very, very much on point. Um, and I, I'd recommend this journal highly. And again, it's, it's a sister publication of JDS. Uh, the paper today is by graduate student um, Matt, Matthias Piter et al. And uh, Marcia will talk about her, him in just a minute. 
but the, the paper is entitled Association Between Change in Body Weight During Early Lactation and Milk Production in Automatic Milking, milking System Herds. And the reason I picked this is I, in the last couple of years of my career, I developed quite an interest in fresh cow nutrition, and this fits that very well. So for, first, Marcia, could you tell us a little bit about this, the student uh, who did do, led this work? Sounds great. Uh, thank you, first of all, Bill, for inviting me to join you in the podcast. It's exciting to be here. Uh, so the student that worked on this particular uh, paper, uh, this was one of his chapters for his thesis, his PhD thesis. He is originally from Brazil, uh, Dr. Matheus Spider. Uh, he's a veterinarian, trained as a veterinarian like I am. So he came to me first as an intern doing some uh, vet work, and then he decided to stay for a PhD. And uh, he uh, worked in various projects related to data that we collected from robotic milking systems. We also have an interesting paper on rumination time and how that is associated with peak milk yield that was published in Journal of Dairy Science uh, as part of his thesis also, and uh, some other papers on this topic, um, on this topic of robotic milking and data, if you will, and how that is, is related to health or production. So uh, Mateus graduated and is now working for Cargill in their cargo digital solutions division. So he is the director of North American sales, which is not really sales, it's more like connecting with various companies that have technology, uh, technology that can be used for um, monitoring herds, monitoring cows, improving nutrition and so on. So he actually works across uh, Canada and US uh, in this role. And he's based here in Minnesota still, but again, it's a remote uh, position. So he could be anywhere, but he chose to stay in Minnesota. So I'm very pleased to, to see him going, moving forward uh, in, this, in this role and this direction. And uh, it's an area that I'm really been focusing on in the last few years, whole precision uh, dairy uh, farming. So he's still in that area. So we're colleagues now in that field. So it's really nice. Well, thank you. Thanks. I'm going to ask you the same question. I almost start start all, always with is why did you do this experiment or what was the hypothesis behind yeah. the experiment? So a lot of the work that I do is observational in nature, meaning that I work with a lot of commercial dairy farms in the region, be it Minnesota, Wisconsin, sometimes we'll go to South Dakota or Iowa. And so just from the get go, we need to make it clear. I'm not doing cause and effect, you know, controlled studies. I'm doing like more associative kind of things, but we had a data set that I had, we had collected for other reasons, but this data set had uh, body weights, individual body weights uh, for every cow that comes into the robot box every day. And we were not using the data. So I talked with Matheus and I was thinking, we have these individual weights, let's, you know, for the farms that we have, uh, this data set had about 60 farms, but 34 of them had individual body weights that we could trust, if you will. So every time the cow gets into that box, we get the, the weight. So it's different than previous research where we maybe get body weights once a day or maybe weekly. And then we look at relationships with uh, health or production and so on. And I, I thought, why don't we see if that during the transition period, we always talked about um, cows will lose body condition score. We know that's a fact. Uh, our cows are selected for high production, our Holstein cows, and these are all Holstein cows. And we know that they lose condition, but we do not have a lot of data on body weight change in early lactation. So uh, we're curious to see if the body weight change in the beginning of a lactation, that first 21 days of the transition period, would have any relationship with their productivity down later in lactation. And we did not measure health. Unfortunately, we do not have the health data here, but we know the productive cows um, Healthier cows are more productive cows. So it's more like a proxy for health. Unfortunately, I cannot talk about that because we didn't measure it. But we want to see, um, is it okay for cows to lose body weight during that transition period and still be productive? We're surprised to find what we found, which I think we're going to discuss later. But my, my hypothesis was we're going to see some, ch some change in body weight. But I did not know exactly how, how much would be the loss that would be influenced productivity, if you will. Or if cows that lost 
a lot of weight or gain weight, what will be their productivity? Is there any influence on that? We're surprised to see what we found, to be honest. Uh, we, we did find some quadratic type of relationships that I didn't expect necessarily to see. And we're going to discuss that, I think, Bill, in more detail. But yeah. I was very, it's just exploratory. I, I like doing these exploratory studies because <laughs> there's so much data these days with technology. We can explore different avenues. So it's exploratory in nature, hopefully leading to more controlled studies by somebody else down the down the road, maybe. And, and this is a huge, you know, for more than again, for more than forty six hundred records, cows. Right, right. So this is a huge data set. I mean, right, right. A university could never generate this type of data. It, exactly, so exactly. Yeah. Yes. I'm curious, Marcia, did you also collect any reproductive data? I'm recalling a, a podcast we did with Dr. Paul Fricke on the high fertility cycle, and it was related to uh, weight loss as it relates to uh, reproduction. I'm just kind of curious if, if, you, if you measured that as well. We did not measure reproduction. Uh, one aspect of these systems, um, I'm talking about here the software and all that that exists for robotic systems. Unfortunately, reproduction is not a very um, good, they don't have very good metrics for that. They're improving. So the new Lely Horizon software, it does a little bit better job looking at reproduction uh, metrics such as pregnancy rate, for example, and things like that. But at this time, uh, the data set we had, we do not have a lot of data on repro, so I could not go there. All right. Thank you. Yeah, that's observational. So we don't, hmm. you know, we cannot have everything we want. Yeah. <laughs> so I did not have it. I wish I did. <laughs> I think it's interesting too that you're able to use actual body weights. You know, the the standard of the industry has been body condition scoring, but right, right. Um, that's done on various different days by different scorers and mm -hmm. and whatnot. And an actual weight and, and averaging that weight, and as said in the paper, over a time period, so right. very accurate and, and doing it on consistent days. I think this is a an opportunity to really measure at much more accurate level of body weight condition loss than than maybe other methods. Right. That's what we thought. So that's why we went in this direction. Yes. I think without a question, body weight change in production studies are the weakest measurement we have. Right. And, and, you know, we measure once a week, maybe cows, mm -hmm. body weight can change 10, 15 kilos mm -hmm. by the time they walk across the scale. So this, this right. data I think is an excellent data set for body weight and body weight change. Thank it really you. helped normalize for gut fill and, and as well as, you know, right. Right. utter fill and whatnot so that that's that's really exciting mm -hmm. yes and, and and we did have average end up and this is a reviewer suggestion we had two days before the reviewers had to do across three days yep. so i do appreciate the reviewers kudos to reviewers when they do help us make our papers better so we changed to a three-day average in the beginning and a three-day at the end also and we called the initial body weight and the 21-day body weight but that evens it out even better so hopefully more accurate yes and I don't in these is pubcast. I don't like to go a lot into statistics, but <laughs> in your model, you, you took in season, which we're not going to talk about. No, you mm -hmm. broke cows down into first parity, second right. parity, and third plus, right. and then correlated or looked at the relationship between mm -hmm. body weight change and milk production. And and you picked the first ninety days of production. Is there is any reason you picked that or? So one reason we did is that we want to have as many cows as we could, because sometimes cows might be called later on. So we want to make sure we had the most cows. So by going up to just 90 days, we were ensuing our lactation. We have this high producing, high producing cow group. We did the correlation all the way to 120 days. And I think actually Mateos might have checked even to 150 to the cows that we still had at 150. We have very high correlation, 0.99. So it was representing the most productive cows, if you will, like the production of those animals. So 90 days allowed us to have this, like you said, almost 4,700 4, 700 cows in the data set, which gives us more, you know, more replication, if you will. So that's kind of the reason we chose 90 days. And previous study, we found that the peak milk for these cows is more around uh, 50 to 60 for the mature cows, about 70 or so, maybe for uh, heifers and robots. So we were kind of Past, a little bit past the peak milk, but still high and high production. So we, we decided to choose. That was just, uh, I don't know, could have picked something else, but we picked 90 to get enough animals and, and get a little more of a longer period than just the beginning of lactation, you know, like a little further in. So 90 was a good compromise there. 
And it, it, it is correlated to whole lactation production pretty right. well. So, I mean, right. if they're, they're, the differences here will probably continue through the whole lactation. Right? The, the relationship point. you found. The relationship with being the most productive cow. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. um, one, one thing, again, because this is such a good data set of body weights. Um, you know, the, what I what I know is you had, I've rounded these off a little bit. So the first lactation started at 600 kilos, second at 690 third at 750 kilos you know that they, they have to grow a lot those mm -hmm. first two lactations a huge amount i think much more than people think right that is true that is very true yes and many times we manage these herds around them only growing in that first lactation yeah. and we forget about mm -hmm. the continued growth yeah mm -hmm. separated for that reason we had what we call the sophomores and all the second lactation mm -hmm. Is there a difference? So we separated. They behaved similarly to the mature cows in terms of loss of uh, body weight, and their response was very similar, about 5% body loss, and then being the most productive cow. Um, over, over the years, I've been doing research with data from these robots, and I find that the second and third lactation cows are somewhat similar, how they respond in terms of rumination time, and in this case, body weight change, and so on. And the first lactation cows are very different. They, they, they have to be treated differently in these systems and on farms in general, because like we just said, they're growing, they're a different, a different animal. Um, and in this case, we're surprised to find that most productive heifers actually lost more body weight on a percentage basis than even the older cows. I was a little surprised about that, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, but one last comment before we get into your actual data. Okay, sorry. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, that's fine. Uh, when I calculate, these cows had to grow about uh, 200 grams a day. From, wow. from mm -hmm. calving up through the third lactation, that's mm -hmm. 365 days a year. Um, that's a kilo and a half, two kilos of milk, and the energy equivalent to one and a half to two kilos of milk. So that's a good point. We can't, though. We can't yeah. ignore this growth, and like like we said, it's the second lactation as well. True, very good point. So they're still growing, and they still need that, right? Good point. Okay, so the the gist of this was loss and body weight relationship. Mm -hmm. So why don't you? How much did these these animals lose approximately, if you can remember. They all lost body weight, I remember, on average, of course. And, okay, so the average body weight loss was, let's see here, 3.65%, uh, but it, it's kind of uh, <clears throat> the overall body weight change, but uh, across, across all cows, because some actually gained weight and some lost a lot more, right? So that about that five percent range, there are four percent was the overall average. The best cows, probably not yet, but the best cows are the ones that are kind of in that middle uh, range of both the four. And it was about it percent. averaged about thirty. I'm again rounding things up, but about thirty kilos right. uh, across the three groups right. um, in twenty one days. That's you know calculate mm -hmm. that's more than a kilo. It's more than two pounds a day. They're losing. Mm -hmm. Um, so again, they, these cows lose a lot and mobilize a lot of body. Um, and, and you, you found a, a quadratic relationship mm -hmm. between body weight loss, the first 21 days and, and, uh, and milk production, the first 90 days, right. Which would suggest that if cows don't lose enough, they aren't productive or if they lose too much, they aren't productive. So mm -hmm. well, first of all, do you remember the where that optimal was, the optimal weight loss with respect to milk production for the three groups or the two groups. So the groups. yeah, the optimum appears to be for the the older cows, you know, second and greater would be around the five percent ballpark range. Like um, so, more specific was I think five percent for the second and five, uh, four point five for the older cows. And then the, the half for the first lactation cows, that was seven point four percent. That was the optimum. So those animals um, were the ones that were most productive. So like I said, the ones that gained more, more than that or lost a lot more than that, they are our assumption. Again, we cannot test this hypothesis, but our assumption was that um, cows that lost more were the, the cows that were sick potentially cows that did not go to the bunk, they're off feed, they had ketosis. I mean, they, they just didn't do as well. So they uh, lost more weight. The cows on the other end that gained more weight were, again, thinking maybe these are animals that do not have the genetic potential as much to produce milk. So they're not diverting or using as much of their body uh, reserves to get to that high production 
uh, like, the, like the cows that lost 5%. That's kind of our assumption. Again, this will have to be proven by more controlled studies, but that's kind of what we thought might be happening. Well, it makes sense to me that, you know, if they lose a lot, they're obviously not eating enough mm -hmm. um, and sickness or health is usually right. contributing. And, and if they don't lose enough, you know, it could be genetics or it could be the mm -hmm. diet. You know, we, we found mm -hmm. adding protein to these fresh cow diets really increases production and increases mobilization. So it could be also diet related as well. Mm -hmm. Good point. Yes, that's one thing we could not necessarily include as a factor for uh, for the analysis, because we don't have we have maybe the TMR for these farms, but we do not have should, should say the partial mixed ration protein content, but we do not have the content of the grain that was fed in the robot, and that varies uh, depending on the level of production, a stage of lactation, so that would be really difficult to include in the model, um, but we do have uh, again. It's just at one point in time, which makes me nervous, is that we did test all the partial mixed rations for protein and NDF and so on and fat, but it, we, didn't, we did not include in the model here um, for that. And I think we had a pretty good, um, I think we reported here somewhere, the, how much the model explained the variation in body yeah, weight. Yeah. It was, it was pretty lot. high. It was very high, which I was surprised, actually. When Matils told me that and showed me the data from R, I was like, wow, what's going on here? That's a pretty high number. Because yeah. <laughs> that body weight is a marker for other things. Exactly. So exactly it's exactly. just what's happening. But it was a pretty strong model. Yeah. Um, I was pretty happy with it when he told me that. I was like, wow, that's pretty good. Uh, let's put that in the, uh, in the uh, yeah, 0.99 was our uh, R squared for the model, which is really high. Uh, very 0.99. Good, very good. Uh, and like you said, yeah. body weight change is a marker for all the intake. A lot of things go right. into that. So you'd expect right. a pretty good fit. Right, right. Mm -hmm. And I think what I, th I really would want to emphasize here is a lot of people think cows should not lose weight when they calve. And, and they should. They're designed, yes. to, not too much, but they're designed mm -hmm. to mobilize body. And right. this idea to, that if they're not losing a little condition is a good, may, may not be a, a good idea. Very good point. Especially the cows we have, right? Well, we selected these Holstein cows for this. So they are going to lose weight because they cannot eat enough for what they're producing. So it's expected as long as they recover, uh, they, they can lose some and not have problems. They're going to be productive, healthy cows. Uh, yes, I completely agree. And I think we're, yeah, we need to get that concept in our heads, I think. You know, at, at your optimal body weight loss, they, they were averaging you know, one and a half to two kilos of body weight loss a day. For, exactly. For, again, this is only three weeks, so you we right. hope they're hope right. they're coming back. Coming back, right? Mm -hmm. And, right. and right. you know, it's actually worse because their their intake is going up at this time. So mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. gut fill is going up. So the right. the actual loss in body true body weight is greater than what what you recorded here. So Very, yeah, these cows are designed to yeah. lose a lot of weight. Yes. It would be interesting to see it at what day the nadir of body weight was. Yeah, I, you know, I agree. We, we guess 40, 50, right? Somewhere in there. Or 30, yeah, we might 40, have 40. that. I don't remember if Matils looked at that, but yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, that would, If you have that data, that would be very useful. Yeah, sure. You have such mm -hmm. a huge data set here. Right, right. Good point. Yeah. I yeah, don't remember that, if we did or not, but I have to double check. You know, yeah. the, the data we use for that is, is quite old now, and, and <laughs> right. these cows probably have changed. So That's very true. Cows will change uh, as we improve genetics and so on. So And how we feed them. Yes, how we feed them has changed. Yes, exactly. absolutely. absolutely. This emphasizes to me how much maybe more management pressure or or management intensity we need to be on fresh cows rather than mm -hmm. kick them to the high group and hope for the best without a doubt maybe we need to be managing body condition body weight changes a lot more aggressively yes that would be very helpful yep. mm -hmm. and, and computer herds you have or robot herds you know you have a little more flexibility in managing these mm -hmm. But even in, in confi regular confinement herds, you know, a, a fresh cow group, I'm a big proponent of a fresh cow group that is fed a very specific diet. So I agree. I think that makes a huge difference. And how long would you have that fresh cow group? How long would they be in there, Bill? 
I think I like three weeks because, okay. you know, it's, it's, if you go to, it's going to be an expensive diet. So you can't leave them in there forever. And if it's only a week or so, you got to say, is it worth all the effort? So I, I don't have any data. That's my opinion. But I think it's right around three weeks, a good number. I think the most successful farms do have that group, right? And they feed them a little bit differently. I'm going to mention a study that we've done recently that's not related to this at all, but we had a supplement, and I'm not going to name the supplement, I guess, but we had a supplement that was uh, fed to cows just in the first 30 days in milk. And in robots, we can feed cows uh, in in a group. They're all together, but we can feed something else in the robot, assign treatments, which was very cool for my student. It's a different student, but to do that. And we saw a response of seven pounds of milk um, from feeding the supplement to this fresh cow. So yeah, that, that, that is absolutely a place to have a fresh cow group and feed them something more expensive that will really bring them up. And of course, if they peak higher, they'll be producing more milk throughout their lactation. So exactly. and, there's and more you, to be you done. Got, and you, mm-hmm. you want them to eat, obviously. They, get, right. they have to eat more, too. If you just get more milk with no intake, you're right. not going to be happy right. with the results. Yes, so. yes. So they were fed more of this additional supplement, if you will, that really helped them. Yeah. And I guess just, uh, you know, I'm looking at the graph here that came with this paper on the, the, the quadratic shape and mm-hmm. uh, on the, the difference in milk yield between, you know, the worst and the, the optimal body weight change and then compare it to kind of the extremes. We're not talking small amounts of milk mm-hmm. here. Can you give us, do you give us some idea of how much of, a, again, so, from the extremes, more or less? Which yeah, I think we had kind of tried to put a number in there just for helping with calculations so for people to kind of have an idea. So we, let's see, let's see for the older cows. So basically, if you look at um, cows that lost the, the mature cows, the peri tree, three and greater, so the ones that lost um, more weight, they had a production during that period of uh, 3,600 kilos. And uh, the ones that gained, there's 3,000 compared to 4,500. So we look at that anywhere from 1,000 to 1,500 kilos per day in 90 days, 30, 35 pounds of difference per day. So, between the, the lowest yeah, producing and the highest. Those are the extremes, but even if right. you go halfway in between, right. it's still you know, 10 or 15, easily 10 or 15 right. pounds a day. So. 10 or 15 pounds a day, right, and of difference. Again, it's so huge. Not, it's not small numbers. It's big yeah, numbers. Exactly. Right. So man, managing and monitoring body weight, I think, body mm-hmm. weight change to me has tremendous management potential, like, yes. especially with technology now where we can, can do it in a lot of herds. Right. Right. Definitely. Definitely. I mean, if we can use this as a metric, if it's available, I definitely recommend because we can identify those cows that might be in trouble right away. Or we can identify cows that are need to be fed differently, like you said, maybe to not gain that much weight, but produce more milk. Like you said, maybe it's a nutrition reason that they're gaining so much. Yeah, just that management will be really good. I guess my, my last question would be, you know, this was a robot herd or robot herds. Right. Is it is it, is there any reason this can't be extrapolatable to, you know, conventional farms? Well, they feed them a little bit differently, right? Because they have a partial mixed ration and then cows are supplemented. But most of the farms and most of the farms bill will be supplementing based on milk yield, right? So it's possible that animals they were producing, which is actually be even the opposite. The cows are producing less milk, should be getting less supplements. So why did I gain more weight? That makes me think, uh, oh my God. So I think it probably is extrapolatable because, um, yeah, the difference could be even more, more, and it was not. So I think if we can feed those fresh cows in a separate group, I think we can you know, be able to monitor or manage this a little bit better and gain have some benefit from monitoring the weight of those cows i just it's more difficult in a conventional herd however to feed them more individually versus in a robot i can adjust based on the what we learned here i can adjust maybe a cow getting more or less of that supplement that's mm-hmm. in the robot and then make sure they did either don't lose too much or they actually don't gain too much uh, i think it's more it's easier to manage when we can individually feed 
in the robot, which we cannot do in a conventional herd. It's a bit harder, I think. But then we have access to feed. Make sure we don't overcrowd the fresh pen. So cows have the ability to eat what you put in that fresh cow diet to make them make more milk. That becomes very important. So I'm a, a proponent because also one of my areas of uh, emphasis is cow comfort research. Let's make sure they have space so they can access the feed. The feed is pushed up. So those submissive animals that might not be able to eat as much for whatever reason and maybe lose weight, they have access and they can eat and not lose too much, let's say. Um, so I think it takes that management, which is not easy. It's easier said than done, but. No doubt. It's, it's yeah. well worth the effort on fresh cows. Yes. That pays, that pays or, or it either costs you or it pays for the next 300 days. So. Exactly. So fresh cow emphasis, we need to do better yet. We've improved, I think, in, on farms, but I think there's more room yet. And uh, definitely like your talks now recently, Bill, about the peak lactation and then monitoring fresh, you know, what you do in the fresh cows is excellent. So appreciate you coming to talk to our <clears throat> conference in June. <laughs> Pleased to have you come and talk to us at the Forest State Dairy Nutrition and Management Conference. It's always great to have you because you are such a draw and we want to have you there. So thank you for coming for that. So a little ad here. Sorry. But. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say with the genetics we have right now for milk production, we are probably throttling a lot of cows in early lactation because of our inability to um, meet their uh, calorie as well as amino acid requirements. Very good exactly. point. Very good point. So we're limiting those animals and they're not getting to their full potential. That's an argument that, for example, robotic robotic companies have is that robots allow those cows to reach full potential because we're feeding them to their potential, which it, that's what they say. It's not quite that far, but yeah, there is a little bit more room for, for being able to do that. Uh, Marcia, also, I was, I was kind of curious if you were uh, to do this study over again or or, or, or do a, a new study, what kind of data would you want to capture that you didn't capture this time? Yeah, you mentioned the reproduction data, right? If I had yeah. access to that, to be able to include what does this do to repro and also have health data. So I could That's say, I yes, thinking. these animals that were losing a lot of weight, we could prove, if you will, that those are the animals that had some health issues. That So these farmers didn't do a great job of monitoring and recording those things, so I could not include in the model. I would have maybe a handful, maybe 10 or 11 farms that were recording things that I felt like these are good records, so I couldn't use it. So I have a, better records for health um, would be would be great. Uh, this is a, num a huge number of farms, so I don't expect that we could uh, be on all these farms to do our own assessment of health. It's really difficult, uh, logistically speaking, but if I could, you know, have uh, billion, billions of dollars and multiple people to actually test cows and get beta hydroxyburates and nephas and everything and kind of know what's going on that would have been fun uh, to have also so you know kind of in closing what i'd like you guys to do is just kind of talk a little bit about what maybe be some of the the practical uh implications of this study uh for for the dairy farmer and nutritionists out there and uh, pete can we start with you Tonight's last call question is brought to you by NitroSure Precision Release Nitrogen. NitroSure delivers a complete TMR for the rumen microbiome, helping you feed the microbes that feed your cows. To learn more about maximizing microbial protein output while reducing your carbon footprint, visit balcom.com slash NitroSure. Uh, not to beat a dead horse or, or get too you know repetitive, but I think... Um, we are going to have to, as the dairy industry evolves, uh, understand that we probably are not managing fresh cows nearly as intensely as we need to be and um, understand that they their needs for, for calories as well as amino acids and early lactation um, are probably greater than we knew of or and we need to just do a better job supplying them and allowing them to be comfortable and allow them to eat and and really to reach their peak potential. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well said, Pete. Dr. Weiss, uh, any final closing comments? Well, I just, uh, a lot of what Pete said, I agree 100% with, and I just, uh, to expand this a little again, is that you know, cow, mammals are designed to mobilize, female mammals are designed to mobilize body reserves. So this idea that cows should not lose any condition in early lactation is wrong. We don't want them to lose too much, 
but losing some condition is perfectly normal. We have to work around that balance, include that in our formulation goals. Yeah, very well. Marcia, I'm going to ask you to do two things, kind of give us a wrap up. And then the last thing I want you to do is give us a brief commercial for the Four State Nutrition Conference and why people should attend this year. Kind of just get a real quick overview. So I agree with both points that were made. Uh, and I definitely uh, um, think we should be doing better as we work with these fresh cows uh, and also be not concerned, if you will, if they lose some weight, that's normal. And in addition, I think technology today is going to allow, hopefully allow us to, to have more data, not just body weights, but other data that's going to help us better monitor those fresh cows and intervene as needed. So uh, I'm, I'm proponing of technology for that reason too, as we monitor uh, individual animals. The Four State Conference, um, we're excited to have it uh, in June, early June. Uh, I think it's the 5th and 6th of June. So we are very excited to have our pre-conference sponsored by Balcom. Pre-conference symposium is always very good attendance. We usually get most of the attendees come for the pre-conference, uh, which starts at 8 a.m. or 8.30 a.m. on the on the uh, first day. And uh, most of our uh, participants come earlier for that. I would say 80 to 90 percent of them, actually. Our attendance is really, really good. And we are from five to six hundred people. We have mostly nutritionists that attend, but others, veterinarians, a few their producers also. So it's a great, a great event that uh, has been around many years before my time. But uh, I'm on the planning committee uh, from Minnesota, along with Jim Sulfur, uh, who's from Minnesota. It's four states, uh, Wisconsin, um, Illinois, Iowa, and Minnesota. So each state has two people on the committee, planning committee. And the, the rest of the, uh, again, we continue uh, at 1.30 p.m. We start our conference, if you will. And now we have some presenters like Dr. Weiss and others. Um, participating and we do, do have uh, nice discussions too for for during that for example this his session we're gonna have a panel of a couple maybe nutritionists coming in to talk about how they feed cows and achieve this high peaks and uh, how they maybe manage the fresh cows and so on anyway and we end the conference uh around noon on the second day so uh for state dairy conference. If you Google that, uh, you'll find our website. I think the programs should be already all uploaded and posted. We have great sponsors, of course, Balkan being the platinum sponsor this year. So appreciate your sponsorship. And we have uh, this pre-conference. We already have companies signed up to 2032 right now. So it's a very, uh, very competitive uh, pre-conference. Yes. <laughs> Lots of people want to be part of it. So uh, it was your turn this year. So I'm very pleased. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing you in Dubuque, Iowa. In June. Yeah, very well. Well, without a doubt, it is one of the premier nutrition conferences in the country, and we are certainly privileged to be able to host that this year. Uh, Bill, another great paper. Perhaps this might even be in the top 10. I, I, I like oh, this one wow. today. <laughs> uh, very, very interesting. And I kind of like this new, uh, a little abbreviated format. Mm -hmm. I think this might work mm -hmm. out well. So we'll see how the, what, what the audience thinks. Uh, so I appreciate you picking this. Now, uh, Marcia, uh, Peter, Bill, thank you for joining us tonight. It's been a great conversation to our loyal listeners. As always, uh, thank you for joining us for another uh, PubCast. Uh, we hope you learned something. We hope you had some fun. And we hope to see you next time here at the Real Science Exchange, where it's always happy hour and you're always among friends. We'd love to hear your comments or ideas for topics and guests. So please reach out via email to anh.marketing at valchem.com with any suggestions, and we'll work hard to add them to the schedule. Don't forget to leave a five-star rating on your way out. You can request your Real Science Exchange t-shirt in just a few easy steps. Just like or subscribe to the Real Science Exchange and send us a screenshot along with your address and t-shirt size to anh.marketing at balchem.com. Balchem's Real Science Lecture Series of Webinars continues with ruminant-focused topics on the first Tuesday of every month, monogastric-focused topics on the second Tuesday of each month, and quarterly topics for the companion animal segment. Visit balchem.com slash real science to see the latest schedule and to register for upcoming webinars.